Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers. Welcome to the Productivity Talks by the Asian Productivity Organization. I'm Gözde Bosnalı from APO Secretariat and today's moderator. APO is an international organization committed to improving productivity in the Asia-Pacific region. APO Productivity Talks are a platform where these ideas for resolving productivity challenges are addressed by experts, practitioners, and academics to share the latest knowledge on productivity and its practical applications in various sectors. Before we start, I would like to thank our viewers for following us. To be informed about the upcoming P-Talks, please subscribe to our channel and kindly share your likes. You can leave your comments and questions in the chat box for us to answer them after the session. As one of the focus areas of APO is productivity in the public sector, today's P-Talk will be on managing ethics in the public sector. We aim to provide insights on the importance and the basic principles of ethics management in the public sector, including implications for performance and productivity from individual to organizational levels. For today's P-Talk, we have invited Professor Jin Wook Choi from Korea University, Department of Public Administration, to discuss this topic together and answer some of our questions. Professor Choi, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. I want to say it's my pleasure. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Personali and APO for inviting me uh, to this wonderful P-Talk session today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me share a little of Professor Choi's background. Professor Choi holds bachelor's and MA degrees on public administration from Korea University. Later, he was conferred a PhD in political science in the University of Chicago. He has lectured and held directoral positions in the universities of Korea, Hong Kong, and Chicago on policy and governmental studies public administration and international development. Professor Choi's research and teaching interests are regulatory policies, corruption, development assistance, government reform and innovation, and e-government. He has received commendations from the presidency and ministries in Korea, as well as best teaching awards from Korea University. Professor Choi, I would like to share with you that I also served as a government official for many years and personally witnessed various positive and negative cases concerning ethics. So today, me and our viewers are all eager to learn more from you about this topic. So as you begin your presentation, can you please tell us why ethics management is important? So could you please share with us kindly uh, why yeah, ethics management yeah. is important? <laughs> Thank right. you. Right. Okay. Uh, let me explain the importance of the ethics management in this way. Uh, those people who are concerned about productivity, more concerned about the some aspect that provide productivity growth, such as how to improve the competence and you know capabilities of the employees, and also what is kind of new uh, research and development technologies and what is kind of new processes and procedures to improve the productivity and performance. But many people at the same time don't concern so much about ethics management. I would say ethics management is like air. So every people know the air is very important, but usually they don't appreciate the air. But every organization can survive without kind of ethics. So this is like the same function like air. So I would say the ethics management is very important. If an organization, whether a public organization or private organization, is not able to prevent or control individual uh, ethics violation, then those individuals will lose reputation and respect. At the same time, uh, they probably lose their job, and those people will face a legal consequences in a legal lawsuit. And also, when uh, this is rampant, then uh, this unethical violation will demotivate other people. So organization under these circumstances will lose money and time, 
productivity and profit, and also credibility, trust from the people and customers. And I'd like to uh, articulate the importance of two, uh, the importance of ethics management by using two uh, cases. One is from uh, 2006, a Siemens scandal. The another one is a recent scandal outbroke in Korea uh, in the uh, Land and Development Cooperation. Uh, first of all, as you know, that uh, 2016 Siemens uh, scandal caused a lot of troubles to the company and to the market too. Well, Siemens was uh, is kind of well known and very big uh, company in the world that was established early 1980s, and the founder of the Vanaphone Siemens told many years ago. I can sell the future for the short-term profit. But in spite of the philosophy of this, you know, the uh, GMS founder, then there's a serious scandal uproar in 2006. And as you know, then in 2006 and before a couple of years ago, before 2006, Siemens used a lot of some illegal activities uh, to get uh, some bidding from other countries. And also there was a serious money laundering uh, things uh, inside of the organization. So they actually, according to one study, uh, they used uh, some you know, billions of dollars for bribes and uh, uh, illegal money laundering. So what's the kind of consequence? As you see the graph on the uh, stock uh, graph uh, of the GMS right after 2006 and seven, and they lost uh, some stock uh, values from the market. And also the GMS had to pay uh, more than 10 billion uh, euro of penalty. So because of this scandal, they lose a reputation and also they lose the customers investors. So actual consequence because of the scandal was never small. It's a very serious problem. So right after the scandal outbroke and revealed to the market, then GMS started to uh, launch a new uh, ethics management uh, program. Uh, GMS, uh, the new CEO, emphasized the importance of ethics management and they say that the compliance is most uh, priority uh, businesses of the GMS. And what is the kind of strategy that uh, GMS has launched at the moment is that they adopted three strategies. One is the detection and second one is the reaction and third one is prevention. So that means when GMS after noticing uh, this uh, serious uh, scandal, they tried to find any wrongdoings and misbehavior of the employees, and they tried to find what is the cause of this misbehavior and ethics violation, and try to build new training programs, and also you know, introduce new code of ethics. So there are a bunch of efforts of the, the GMS to create a new environment for ethics management. After uh, implementing this new compliance program, now, GMS is regarded as one of the very integral and also the, the organization that values compliance very much. The another example that I want to share with you is that uh, Korea land housing cooperation scandal that was happening in 2021. Uh, Korea land housing cooperation is one of the biggest uh, state-owned enterprises in Korea and its core businesses, including uh, land acquisition, land and urban development, housing construction, including public housing. And because of this function, then uh, the land and housing cooperation has a lot of some crucial information for urban planning and development. So starting from 2017, uh, there was uh, some report that uh, the LH employees purchased uh, more than 10 billion Korean won, which is equivalent to 7 billion US dollars of land in the development areas. This is purely based on using inside information, which is illegal according to Korean uh, code of conduct and law. Uh, they made a, this kind of purchase, expecting that after in, you know, putting this money, then returns must be higher than that. And what happened in 2021 is that one uh, civil organization, which is called Participatory Solidarity, raised this suspicion, and then government realized this violation and started investigation. After the investigation, uh, as of uh, March 2022, more than 3,000 people uh, of the LH employees, public officials, and lawmakers were indicted. And what is more interesting about the consequences of this scandal is that uh, we have a new uh, presidential election 2022. We have the uh, government change. And one of the reasons of government change is because of the big scandal. So that means if the government or the public organization is not able to control 
the ethics violation, it not only uh, make the company lose its reputation, but also has a social impact to uh, you know make the people protest against the government. So this is the reason why the ethics management is so critical and so essential. Thank you, Professor Choi, for this introductory explanations and very striking, striking examples from Zymans and Korea. Now, after this, I would like to ask about connection between ethics and productivity. Could you please briefly elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, the, as I said, the ethics and productivity go in hand. So that means uh, how the organization is able to control and manage uh, compliance uh, and also prevent the violations of ethics inside of the organization, it's definitely helpful for the organization to improve the productivity. So actually the relationship between productivity and ethics management, I show this slide, uh, just in case if the one organization which manages ethics very well, that increase the trust of the organization and also service quality. So if this is happens, then definitely uh, this will increase the, the engagement of people's and commitment in, in doing their job. So when there is a high level of engagement commitment of the employees, then definitely this organization will get higher level of productivity and also improve the service quality. When the customers and consumers are using the high quality service and, and goods, then definitely they have uh, the high level of reliability and the value of the organization. Definitely it is, uh, you know, very helpful for the organization to improve the trust of the people. So this is a kind of, you know, the very virtuous cycle. So that means if the organization is able to, you know, hold the high level ethics management, it is good for the trust of the government, trust of the organization, and also improve the productivity of the uh, employees. And if you observe the recent, uh, some emphasis on ESG, then definitely the ethics management beyond that, uh, this argument. That means uh, ESG is a composed of three uh, the factors, environmental, social, and governance. And each kind of pillar consists of several so components, but when you look at the governance pillar, then definitely uh, inside of governance pillar, business ethics, compliance are uh, one of the very important, you know, the components of the ESG. So that means uh, if the organization is able to control the ethics management inside of the organization very well, it is very good for improving ESG level of the organization. very insightful information professor Choi yeah now to understand the subject deeper uh, could you please give some details on the key concepts of ethics in the public sector okay personally uh, before I giving some key concept on definitions of ethics management I like to highlight the ethics crisis in public and private organizations uh, ethics crisis can happen both in private and public organizations, but there is a big difference between these two types of organizations. Because when the ethics crisis happens in private organization, then it has a very strong signal through the stock market. And when the ethics management goes wrong inside of the organization and the stock, you know, real stock market realizes uh, this situation. And when this uh, mismanagement is revealed, it, uh, to the investors and consumers, and definitely they will leave uh, from this company. Unlike the private organization, public organizations have weak signals when the organization faces ethics crisis. Because unlike the market, they don't have any some signals like the stock prices changes and fluctuations. That means uh, public organization compared to private organizations have weak recuperation mechanism. But again, I want to highlight that when the public organization is rampant with ethics violation, then definitely it causes a lot of some uh, negative consequences, such as uh, public resistance to pay increase for public officials. And also, as I explained, that uh, the high level of uh, ethics violation will demotivate other employees. So many people inside of the organization tend to leave from the organization looking for uh, better managed, uh, better ethics managed organization like that. And some key concept. Uh, there are two things. One is the ethic, uh, workplace ethics, and the second one is core values in the public sector. 
Workplace ethics is well known. This is kind of set of values and moral principles and standards that all employees and employers have to be internalized in both public and private organizations. And they have to follow these values and principles in order to maintain high level of ethics. Uh, at the same time, we need to see uh, there are many some values that the people working in the public organization have to pursue. So uh, traditionally, we can divide uh, core values into three uh, categories. The first one is ethics value, and second one is professional values, and the last one is democratic values. All these are three types of values are critical, but I want to emphasize the ethics value because ethics value is composed of several uh, components like integrity, honesty, and corruptibility in order to gain public trust. So public trust is very essential component for any public organization to pursue. And there's a couple of some uh, typical examples of violations of ethics. One is the ethics violation, including uh, sexual harassment and also exerting undue influences over uh, subordinates. Second uh, violation is a very typical uh, violation of ethics, which is uh, corrupt practices using bribery, embezzlement, theft, and gift giving. Last one, which is uh, less a serious guilt, but uh, also very important, is the conflict of interest. Conflict of interest, as I give an example of Korean scandal, uh, sometimes employees use inside information, and sometimes they give some favors to procurement and contracts to the companies who they know very well or some special uh, kind of ties. And also uh, non-office related works is kind of one example of conflict of interest. So any kind of uh, some violations in this category is thought to be uh, mismanagement of ethics. So but basically I would say the, the what is really happening in mismanagement ethics is more than that. But this is a, a typical uh, illustrations of uh, violations of ethics in an organization. Thank you so much. So after this background, uh, Professor Choi, I'm curious about uh, the global situation concerning ethics in different countries. Could you please share some examples from the world? Yes, uh, Ms. Personali, uh, although showing uh, the level of ethics at country level is extremely difficult. The difficulty comes from the lack of you know, available data. But fortunately, there are several uh, some surveys and studies that try to examine uh, level of ethics of the private organization and also public uh, organizations uh, globally. This is one illustration that is uh, conducted by uh, ECI. ECI is an ethics and compliance initiative, which is one of the biggest uh, nonprofit organizations that try to solve ethics problems uh, of the private organizations. So according to 2021 Global Ethics uh, Business Ethics Survey report, uh, in this report, there are 10 countries in the survey, uh, including Brazil, Ch China, and France, and the United States. Uh, after uh, the finishing the survey, there is one uh, some result is that uh, the, what is the kind of culture strength index globally? That means what is the, the level of ethics of each country in the private uh, cooperations? The global average, of course, is not a global average. This is global average of nine countries, uh, including the survey. Then we can see India has a highest level of, uh, you know, the uh, ethics culture that is 28% out of 100. And some countries like uh, France or Germany or some even, you know, Spain, they have low level of uh, ethics culture in the private cooperation. This is one of the illustration. The another uh, some results from the survey is that what is the kind of percentage of employees observing misconduct is that uh, you can see the you know, country to country kind of comparison. Then global median is that 33% uh, uh, in 2020 uh, survey says that 33% of the employees in the survey uh, replied that they observed the, some uh, misconduct inside of the cooperation. Then what's the kind of some types of the uh, some misconduct is that uh, there is uh, some favoritism towards a certain employees and also there is a management line to employees and also there's uh, some cases of conflict of interest and also improper hiring practices and finally abusive behavior. Even though this is a few examples of the uh, specific types of misconduct, then there are more than that. 
But uh, I don't want to say that uh, these are very specific to those uh, nine countries in the survey, but we can see that there are these kind of violations and misconduct are commonly observed in many private organizations in the world. And the last one is that uh, the observed the percentage of employees that reported observed misconduct. So if you look at this is quite interesting because uh, global level, then uh, more than 80% of people say, employees say that uh, if they observe any misconduct, misconduct conducted by uh, their colleagues or in, uh, the employees inside the organization, 80% of people are willing to report this misconduct. Okay. So what kind of some uh, the employees, percentage of employees reporting most commonly observed misconduct is that favoritism towards a certain employees and management lying to employees and hiring practices, improper hiring practices like that. And uh, why I'm telling this is quite interesting is that there are more people who are willing to uh, report the misconduct inside of the organization. That means the employees and clicks are watching over what I'm doing inside of the organization. So just in case if I'm doing wrong, there is a tendency that my clicks and the people around me would report my misconduct. Then what's the consequence? I already told you. You may lose your reputation and lose your job and also face uh, legal consequences. But another same uh, important uh, result uh, from the survey is that just in case if employee uh, report of kind of uh, some misconduct, what is kind of retaliation they experience from the organization? As you see the graph, there are many people who actually face and experience a retaliation from the, uh, the organization. Uh, there are some uh, results that what kind of uh, some employees experiencing uh, misconduct types of the retaliation. So there are something like, uh, you know, other employees intentionally ignore me and began treating me uh, in a different way. You know? Well, sometimes they try to ignore me or you know banning from uh, you know key decision making process, and sometimes there is a lot of different uh, kind of retaliation. You know, uh, for example, I was verbally abused by uh, other employees. So there are different type of retaliation. But the the thing is that uh, if the organization is not able to stop this retaliation then definitely it is very hard for the organization to maintain high level of uh, ethics management. So this is another big concern. So it is very good for employees to report voluntarily uh, any misconduct conducted by the inside of the organization, but at the same time, how the organization has to deal with this retaliation, retaliatory you know, practices inside of the organization is very important. And this is another uh, some data that shows the uh, the integrity level of the country using index of public integrity, IPI. IPI is measured based on six dimensions, uh, including judicial independence, administrative burden, and trade openness, and budget transparency, its citizenship, and press of freedom. Uh, so based on these uh, six dimensions, then IPI can be uh, ranked like this way. And if you look at the case of Korea, case was ranked uh, quite high in terms of IPI. So just compare uh, your country's position ranking to other countries and probably can see what is the weakest link in improving the level of uh, integrity of the country. And finally, I want to share the World Bank 2021 survey on ethics and corruption in federal public service of Brazil. Even though uh, the Brazil, I, I'm bringing the Brazilian case, but uh, this is not a very Brazil specific example. This is a kind of example that you can see in other countries too. So if you look at uh, some you know, result of this survey, then what is a kind of uh, some, um, for example, uh, some distributional practices observed by civil servant who witnesses uh, on ethical behavior. Uh, you know, on the top, there is kind of one reply. Uh, reply is that using the position to help uh, friends and family member. And second one is that uh, bending the rules when there is uh, pressure from the supervisor. Okay? And on the right hand side, there is kind of result uh, that uh, explain the, in the less of, the question is like that. In the last three years, did you witness other servants engaging in any part of ethical practices below your organization. And there are 
in a way, people say, yes, they observed the, uh, these kind of things. Then where and uh, where the, the uh, violations you know, occurred? Uh, one of the most uh, often cited uh, response was that there was a violation of ethics in the formulation of policies and project or programs. So there are a bunch of uh, some uh, chances or some procedures inside of the organization that a uh, violation of ethics can occur. And the next slide one is that uh, who actually then uh, tried to pressure uh, the uh, the the you know pressurize the some uh, uh, you know members of the organization to uh, engage in, in violations of ethics. And there are many people actually who try to exert undue influence. For example, hierarchical you know, superior. That is uh, some kind of direct or indirect boss of the employees. So many of the pressure, undue inf you know, influence and pressure are actually coming from uh, hierarchical superior, like uh, some you know, immediate boss or uh, indirect boss. So uh, if this happens, then we realize that that you know how the relationship between uh, you know the supervisors and the subordinates uh, have their relationship. So, just uh, the organization have to you know carefully observe when there is any uh, necessary undue influence between these uh, you know members in order to uh, prevent the violations of ethics. Uh, those were very interesting statistics and graphs, Professor Choi. Thanks for sharing them. Uh, and so based on all these cases and statistics, uh, how can we address in our organization and monitor and manage ethics in organizations? Well, uh, Ms. Bosnali, uh, your question is about what is the kind of strategy to improve the ethics level of the organization? Uh, this is a very challenging kind of question. But uh, my question is that, do we value ethics? And then my answer is that most people feel new and they value ethics. But then the, the question, real question is that even though uh, the my organization ethics level is uh, low, then do I have really have an intention to change this situation? I don't think this is not uh, serious because as I mentioned already, if I know the some mismanagement of the organization from my boss or from the organization, even they know this information, they don't want to reveal this information because they're afraid of retaliation. Then, how do we know the level of ethics in our organization? First of all, we have to realize that what is the exact and precise level of ethics of the organization, of my organization. So uh, for this, we have to collect, try to collect some relevant data to show the level of ethics. Okay? But in spite of this, uh, you know, even if there is no such kind of data to show the level of ethics in my organization, but intuitively, every people knows it. You know, every people knows it means that uh, every people knows that whether my organization is ethical or not ethical, or my colleagues are doing a good job, or really I make a lot of some wrongdoings. We know that. So the question is that how we can manage the ethics. There are many strategies and suggestions proposed by scholars and international organizations. I'd like to introduce one of the uh, some strategy that I was uh, you know, introduced by OECD and their framework and the strategy is called the basic behavior analysis, strategy and intervention and change. And behavior means that the organization have to observe very carefully what are the, some uh, wrongdoings and uh, misbehavior of the employees. And that analysis means that they have to identify what other some sectors and what are the stages of the uh, work processes and what, what are the people that engage in uh, ethics violations so frequently. Based on this analysis of behavior, they have to come up with some strategies. And also based on strategies, they can intervene uh, very rigorously. Uh, in dealing with strategies, there are two approaches. One is ex ante prevention and second one, ex post uh, punishment. Ex ante prevention is kind of preventing the ethics violation before this misbehavior happens. So ex ante prevention is getting possible through education and nurturing some values of the employees about the integrity and honesty. 
But unfortunately, this accident prevention is hardly accomplished in the real world because you know education and also education based uh, some value changes takes a long time. So most of the organization tend to prefer ex post punishment. Ex post punishment is that when you no know, violations of acts is detected, there must be zero tolerance uh, punishment. So they have to compel employees to realize that when I engage in misbehavior or violate the ethics, then definitely the cost is much higher than the benefits I can get from that. So based on the combination of ex anti prevention and also ex post punishment strategy, they tend to change their the mindset or the culture of the organization towards in a high level of ethics. And here, I want to say, uh, in observing some risk factors that affect the level of ethics of the organization, as I mentioned, identification is very important. In the process of the identification of the uh, some you know, risk factors of the violation of ethics, there are three different uh, some factors. One is the actual uh, the risk. Actual risk is something that is actually happening inside the organization. The second one is perceive the risk. Perceive the risk is that even though we can observe the real uh, violation of ethics, but many people realize that this is possibly uh, the you know weak area for the violations of ethics. And the final one is a potential risk. Potential risk risk must be also concerned very much by the organization because potential risk is that even though violations of ethics is not happening right now, or this is very weak point of the violations of ethics, but when they observe their works and the, the people's relationship, if there is any potential to uh, cause any you know, ethics violation, the organization has to deal with three different type of risks, actual, perceived, and potential risks. So as I mentioned already, even though conceptually we can divide into three different type of you know, risk factors, but I believe that many people inside of the organization know what is the risk inside of the organization. So they have to think about what is kind of strategy uh, to deal with uh, these risks. Uh, as I uh, give an example in the World Bank Brazilian uh, kind of survey, uh, the organization may consider to prepare and develop this um, risk matrix. One is that what is the kind of uh, some behavior and some area which is very volatile to the violations of ethics. This is a y-axis and s axis is that who actually causes violations of ethics? Who are the causes uh, of this violation? So when you combine these two you know, axes, then we can see that uh, which sector and which you know, segment is more uh, critical to uh, you know, uh, weaken the level of ethics in our organization. So based on the developing and also the making this uh, risk ma in matrix, then the organization has better information, uh, which is the weakest link and what's the priority in order to maintain high level ethics. And this is one of the very simple flow chart to control as an example of violations of ethics is conflict of interest management. So if you look at closely this flow chart, the simple principle is that if there is any potential or real uh, danger of violations of ethics or conflict of interest, then you have to report it to the organization and management. If there is the, the management side believe that the level of conflict of interest is not very strong and is very low, then definitely they will continue their work. Otherwise, they have to come up with uh, some the the measures to reduce the potential dangers of conflict of interest. In this uh, you know, flow chart, there's always kind of record, record, record. That means if there is any slight and small examples of the conflict of interest possibility, then the organization have to realize this danger and have to record it and in order to make any some plausible, uh, some strategies and remedies to solve this problem. And finally, I want to start my presentation uh, by suggesting some key strategies for ethics management. And as a matter of fact, there are many you know, guidelines and recommendations about ethics management. But uh, among the common you know, elements, I would say there are seven uh, key uh, some priorities. One is that the organization has to demonstrate a strong and consistent will of ethics leadership from the top and the senior management. This is an example how Siemens has changed a lot in terms of you know, compliance and ethics management after the crisis and launching new uh, management. 
And second one is that uh, the, the organization needs to create a dedicated unit for ethics management. And third one, if the violations of ethics is coming from unclear code of ethics, and definitely they have to prepare and develop a new uh, clear code of ethics. And when the organization uh, create a clear code of ethics, it has to share with key stakeholders. Key stakeholders are not necessarily the consumers or investors. It is much more than that. So uh, shareholders, including customers, employees, and suppliers, and competitors, and society as a whole. So you need to uh, share new uh, approach to ethics management of the organization with uh, key stakeholders. Okay? And the number five uh, suggestion is that uh, you have to measure employees' ethics and ethics program on a regular basis in a systematic way. So without knowing some sufficient data, then we really don't know how to uh, prioritize ethics management. So measurement, the level of ethics inside of the organization as a whole, and also employees' uh, level of ethics is very critical. And as I uh, explained already in the strategies, uh, then if organization finds and detect any unethical behavior, they have to get a report and also get it punished. And finally, in order to, uh, you know, the increase the sense of uh, and also mindset of the ethics uh, management, they have to find and develop best practices. And these best practices must be shared within inside the organization and with other stakeholders. And my summary of the ethics management is that, uh, as I uh, already highlighted at the very beginning of my presentation, ethics management is very important, but also is one of the most difficult challenges that every public and private organization faces at this moment. Why this is so difficult? Ethics management is not something about skills and competency. It is more about the values and attitude and mindset of people. So changing values, attitude, and mindset is so difficult and takes time. So organization, individuals, and also must be, you know, the uh, uh, have a song have to, uh, you know, enough time for the organization to change. So in order to see what is the kind of uh, some sequence of changing uh, the ethics management is that I already mentioned leadership and new code of conduct is very important. And based on this uh, le strong leadership and new code of conduct, there must be zero tolerance punishment. And also there must be some training and value-driven behaviors uh, of the employees. And there must be also monitoring mechanism to see if there is any violations. So when these are three components like a detection, training, value-driven behavior, and monitoring uh, kind of are inter uh, interrelated, and also the organization is able to hold these three components, then I believe that organizations can improve the ethics level inside of the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Choi. It was really useful to learn about the background of ethics management and those real life cases. And we hope that our audience will apply that information in their work lives. Now, uh, let me start the Q&A session for more in-depth understanding of the topic. Sure. And my first question for the professor is, so how, uh, we, you have explained the importance of ethics and how to manage it, but how in the real life the issue of ethics perceived, especially in public administration, like how are ethics evaluated differently in the public and private sectors? Well, that's a very difficult question to give one single answer to you. But as I already uh, stressed in my presentation, the difference of uh, the ethics management or approaches in public and private organization is that whether there is a sufficient and adequate freedom and mechanism exists or not. As I mentioned, the private organizations, even though this is not perfect freedom mechanism, but there is kind of some freedom mechanism if there is something wrong inside of the organization. And if this uh, wrong doing of the organization affect the quality and also affect the productivity of the organization, then the market realize that there is something wrong inside of the organization. Then when there is a kind of uh, uh, the, the market receives this signal, then definitely uh, there is a, some negative consequences to the stock market of the company. And also the people like the consumers, investors will leave from this company. But as I uh, already highlighted, public organizations 
don't have this kind of a feeding mechanism. So because of the absence or inadequate feedback mechanism, I would say public organizations are less sensitive in dealing with uh, ethics management. But as I mentioned, some examples like the LH scandal in Korea, then if the public organization is not able to deal with the ethics management or violations of ethics uh, you know, very carefully, then definitely will face uh, serious consequences. So I want to emphasize that even though the ethics management may not be the you know the top priorities of the public organization it must you know deal with this issue very seriously and very carefully yeah that's very true so professor Choi, my second question is, can you explain the major causes that trigger unethical behavior in public services be it corporate or personal reasons Wow, uh, this is also a very challenging question to me, I Miss mean, personality. Uh, there are many studies that try to examine what are the, some causes that trigger uh, some unethical behavior of the employees and also the organization. Among the many causes, I want to say the culture of the organization is most important. That means if the organization allows employees to pursue personal interests and also allow the uh, violation of ethics, you know, then definitely uh, this organization is not able to garner some public trust and public, uh, you know, conf confidence. So when these uh, some uh, misbehavior, you know, as a, you know, in the frame of the uh, organization culture happens, and many organizations don't have any internal monitoring system inside of the organization. So that means, Although uh, every public organization has auditing function and auditing bureau or the uh, unit inside of the organization, but in many cases, this audit you know, function uh, is not carried out properly. So this is a kind of combination. Then there is uh, inadequate uh, monitoring and auditing process inside of the organization. So when this happens, then employees realize that even they engage in wrongdoings, they will not be detected, they will be punished. When these things happens, then it is pervasive throughout the employees in the mindset, then they have the very bad uh, organization culture, then ethics violation is acceptable. This is a very serious problem. So how we can change the culture of the organization is very critical. Thank you for your answer, Professor. So uh, you, you mentioned already the dilemma between uh, reporting and misconduct and being retaliated. Yes. So, uh, do you know any other dilemmas in uh, managing ethics in the public service? Well, uh, I think the the ethical dilemmas come from two different levels. One is that uh, the you know kind of dilemma between individuals and organizations. Uh, it means that uh, the even the organization want to maintain high level of ethics, they will not allow any violations of ethics, but individual employees tend to violate the code of conduct and try to pursue their personal interest instead of the organization interest. But this is a rather simple because if the organization has a strong will to fight against this violation, they can do that. But the real dilemma comes from the level between the organization and public interest. So just in case if the organization, not a personal or individual employee, organization level try to pursue the organization interest, which is very personal interest rather than public interest, then this is really difficult to solve. So uh, in many cases, as I uh, showed uh, some survey result, then even if many employees want to uh, comply with existing rules and code of conduct. Sometimes they are requested by the boss or the organization or the management side that they have to break the rules and the rules. So this is a very serious problem. Uh, here, then what is the kind of some the way to deal with uh, the uh, some ethical dilemma at the level of the organization? Then I think the the uh, civil society and also the media have to keep interest whether the public organization is working properly. So if there's something wrong, they have to politicize and publicize uh, this situation to let the whole society understand what is going on inside of the public organization. 
Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, let me be the devil's advocate now and ask you about, uh, like from a philosophical perspective, so why we need to maintain ethical behavior? Like why do we need to be ethical as unethical behavior may also lead to professional success at times? Uh, Miss Personally, I don't personally think you are a devil's advocate. It's a kind of some one of the curiosity that many, you know, audiences may, you know, concerned. You know, probably they wonder, just in case if I'm working inside of the organization or a private or public organization, just in case if I personally uh, pursue my personal interest instead of public interest or organization interest, sometimes I can get some career success inside of the organization. But unlike the uh, private organization, public organization is different because public organization's value is different from private organization. One of the most critical some values that public employees have to uh, pursue is the public interest. So that means uh, many uh, the people working in the public organization are proud of their work and proud that they are working for the people. This is, uh, I can say, this self-esteem. So even if uh, the one person inside the public organization, you know, try to violate the law and rules of the regulations and also get a succeed inside the organization, I don't think this is a very permanent phenomenon. If this violation happens, in spite of this violation, if some of the employees get succeed inside the organization, I don't think this organization can survive a long period of time. So in order to maintain <clears throat> self-esteem and also long-term career success, then violation of ethics is not a good answer, I would say. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, also you mentioned uh, in your presentation about observed versus recorded cases. Is there a striking difference between them in terms of numbers? Because as I know, uh, as also you mentioned, it's a dark night of the soul to be exposed and witness a misconduct and to decide about reporting it. So you can observe, but you cannot report. So could you please, uh, how the formal and informal mechanisms of grievance can increase reporting rates uh, in different contexts? Well, this is also very uh, not easy question. Uh, uh, you know, Ms. Personali, you asked, so what is the kind of some examples or some mechanisms, formal mechanisms versus informal mechanisms to, uh, you know, the report some wrongdoings inside of the organization. And we know there are several, some formal mechanisms, including uh, internal audit system. But as I told you, uh, some organizations in some countries, the internal auditing function is not working properly. So if this is the case, then uh, the organization may consider to have another form of mechanism like the ombudsman's office or uh, you know, actively you know, protecting whistleblowers. Of course, the effective uh, function of ombudsman and also whistleblowing protection are not easy. But these are kind of some, uh, you know, important uh, channels and mechanisms that uh, some mis, uh, you know, conducts of the organization should be supported. The another formal, uh, you know, grievances mechanisms might be uh, if I uh, observe any some misconduct inside of the organization, I may uh, talk uh, this case with my colleagues informally, but. Uh, I think that using informal mechanism is not a kind of good uh, kind of way to deal with uh, the problems related to ethics violation. So most the organizations and most uh, some scholars and uh, some recommendations are emphasizing the utilization and introduction more formal mechanisms and you know uh, having a good very strong basis of formal grievance mechanism means that the any reporters have uh, be should be ensured that uh, this reporting will not face any retaliation. So having a good uh, some formal mechanism is very important. Then and the the next one is that how this formal mechanism is properly functioning inside the organization is also very critical to make the people confident about the system to protect themselves. In other words, thank you so much. So, Professor, uh, we will uh, now go to the YouTube uh, viewers' questions. But before moving to that, I have a last question. 
so uh, we mentioned about the, how to manage uh, ethics, but can you give more examples on good measures or examples of incentives to enhance and encourage more ethics in public sector? Okay, uh, Ms. Pusanali, uh I would like to answer uh, on your question like this way. Uh, a few years ago, the Harvard professor, Mike Sandel, wrote a book uh, entitled One Money Can't Buy. Uh, in this book, uh, Professor Sandel tried to say that value is a kind of some common good. That means the, the ethics or integrity is something that every organization and employees and even the society has to pursue. So this is a very critical the basis to maintain organization and the, and the society. So Michael Sanders' point of view is that uh, this is something that must be voluntarily you know, nurtured and fostered. It's another kind of something that must be bought using some money. You know? But this is a very ideal approach. So as you, uh, you know, questioned, then uh, some organizations need to use some incentives or some mechanisms to foster people uh, to report the, some misconduct or some maintain the individual or organization, organization level of uh, integrity. Uh, one of the good example uh, is that I want to uh, re-address the, how the GMS has you know, uh, gone through the difficult times uh, since 19, uh, 2006. Uh, there are two things I'd like to say. One is that there must be strong commitment and strong interest from the top of the organization. That means the top, or, top of the organization will not tolerate any misconduct of the uh, violations. This is kind of one of the uh, must, the components that the organization has to pursue. And second one related to incentive is that GMS right now is using some incentive structure. So on a regular basis, like uh, you know, half of a year or once half of the half of a year and once a year, they uh, survey the level of ethics of the you know the you know working you know units, and based on the the evaluation of level of ethics of the uh, the working units, then when the level of ethics of a specific unit is very good. They try to provide some monetary and the monetary incentives, for example, like some bonuses or some, uh, you know, some uh, chances for promotion or providing more resources like that. So this is uh, one of the examples to incentivize uh, the uh, ethics management uh, from GMS example. But I'm not sure whether this is a really the best uh, example as uh, Professor Mike Sant suggested. Thank you for these examples, Professor Choi. Uh, now we have received uh, very good uh, appreciations for your presentation from our viewers, and Thank you. I would like to I would like to share some of the questions raised by our viewers. So, Mr. Mahlok from Malaysia uh, would like to know how can government further encourage public servants other than increasing salaries? Uh, as I told you then uh, salary increase one of the conditions because uh, probably Mr. Malok's point of view is that uh, the one of the reasons why civil servant uh, sometimes commit a corruption and also engage in uh, ethics violation is because they want some extra some benefits and money from these violations of ethics. Yeah, that's maybe true. But if the government uh, realize the this cause of uh, ethics violation and try to you know stop and prevent this behavior by raising salary, and I think this is not a solution. You know, of course, increasing salary is necessary if the civil servant salary is too low. You know? But uh, when government decide to increase the salary in order to improve the ethics uh, management, then definitely there must be following kind of uh, some strategy. That means. After increasing salary, if there is some same violation occurred inside the organization, there must be zero tolerance. So salary increase and zero tolerance enforcement must be combined together in order to see the efficacy of salary increase. Thank you so much for uh, your answer. So our second viewer's question, Professor Pradeep Kumar Rai. Uh, he would like to know how is ethics management 
relevant in controlling the bad impact of vested interests in an organization? Well, this is not an easy question. Uh, the question is that how is ethics management relevant in controlling that in impact of vested interest in an organization? Well, uh, as I told you, uh, there is no one fit size of, you know, there is no one kind of, uh, you know, single, uh, you know, answer uh, to this question. As I mentioned, there are many uh, some you know, components or some recommendation must be carried out simultaneously. As I already highlighted several times, there must be a strong uh, will to fight against the uh, some ethics violations. And also there are other kind of uh, the changes in terms of uh, monitoring mechanism uh, towards against the uh, violations of ethics. And also there must be some efforts for the organization to uh, measure and understand what's the precise level of uh, ethics uh, at the individual level and the unit level and also organization level. So uh, one single uh, solution is not realistic. So any organization which uh, sees that any serious rampant violations of ethics, there must be multiple strategies carried out at the same time. I know this is a very difficult Thank you so much, uh, Professor Choi. You have given us many insight, insights and they were really useful. So uh, would you like to share any final remarks or advices for us and our viewers? Uh, I want to stress again that the organization themselves and also especially uh, those people who occupy the top positions of the organization, they have to realize how ethics management is so important not only to increase the productivity of the organization, but at the same time, in order to get some public trust and confidence from the people. Uh, without those uh, confidence and trust, then definitely we can see uh, any some support from the people and we lose the legitimacy of what we are doing for the people. So in order to restore uh, this confidence and trust, then ethics management is very critical. So thank you once again, Professor, for joining us today. I'm sure that our viewers enjoyed and benefited from your presentation. I would also like to thank our viewers once again and hope that you'll continue watching APOP Talks. So thanks for watching and see you in the next P-Talk. Goodbye for now. Thank you very much.